Hello, everyone. Welcome back for those of you who are addicted to our Skeptical Inquirer Presents. I always say this is my favorite part where I get to see you filter into the room and take your coats off and get comfortable with your own homes now. <laughs> And as you filter in, everybody, welcome, a true and honest open welcome to Skeptical Inquirer Presents. Uh, a welcome back to our returning audience members. Hello to our first timers and a big thank you for those of you who are listening to the recording. Um, I wish you all a happy December, specifically December 3rd. It is the 337th day of the year with 28 days remaining until the end of the year. What could possibly go wrong. Right. <laughs> As you know, uh, Skeptical Inquirer Presents is a series of live online presentations uh, from experts who are, who are devoted to advancing science over pseudoscience, media literacy over conspiracy theories, and critical thinking over magical thinking. Many of our guests were uh, originally scheduled to speak at this year's SciCon in Las Vegas, but uh, the pandemic had other plans. But that's okay, because big ideas can't be contained in conference halls. And that's how this intellectual and informative endeavor got started. And I am still very delighted to uh, be the host. My name is Leanne Lord. I am a stand-up comedian and author. And if you are so inclined, you can find out more about me at veryfunnylady.com. I am also one of the co-hosts for uh, Point of Inquiry, the podcast for the Center for Inquiry. And you can get that wherever you get your podcasts. And, um, you know, as we continue to wrestle with the pandemic, you know, the need for accurate information is even more important. And if it's important to you, I, I, I suggest you check out CFI's Coronavirus Resource Center, which you can find at centerforinquiry.org slash coronavirus. And if you're not already, I also encourage you to subscribe to Skeptical Inquirer magazine. And there are two ways to do that. Uh, you can enjoy a digital subscription and that gives you unlimited online reading access. But with the print edition, uh, you get six issues a year, actual hardcover, not hardcover, but you know, you know, touching issues. You get those delivered to your door. Plus you get the bonus, the bonus everybody, of the digital subscription as well. Now I think that's a really great value. I would pick door number two if I were you. And it's really easy to do that. You can go to skepticalinquirer.org and then hit that subscribe button, which is right at the top of your screen on the website when you go. Now, uh, the flow of the evening is uh, very easy. Uh, you guys keep doing whatever you're doing. You're doing great, by the way, everybody. Don't change a thing. Um, I'll introduce our guest. Uh, he will razzle dazzle us, and then we will open it up for your questions. If you're new here, uh, I will point you to the bottom of your screen. There's a little uh, a button there off to the right that says Q&A. That is indeed the space for your questions. And uh, you, I urge you to please type your question in the form of a question. That would be very helpful. <laughs> and if you miss any of this event, everybody, fret not. It is being recorded and will be available uh, on skepticalinquirer.org sometime tomorrow. And uh, before I forget, our, our speaker is given us, our guest today has given us a very kind offer. Um, it, it's, I guess, for it's, you know, read a new book month, and this will help you do that. Uh, the series of Fortune Events is a, um, get a discount, 30% off, everybody, when you order on the Princeton University Press website. And the offer includes free shipping, and it's good through December 31st. I would get in there sooner you know, Christmas and whatnot, or solstice. Solstice, that's what I meant. Celebrate the solstice with this book. And I'm sure that we've sent out the email with uh, what that code is, um, but I will, I will mention it again at the end uh, so that you, you, know, you, you have it before we go. Uh, but our guest tonight, this is very exciting, is an award-winning scientist, writer, educator, and film producer. He is vice president for science education at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. 
as an internationally recognized evolutionary biologist, he is at the forefront of a field known as evolutionary developmental biology, EvoDevo for short, which I think should be EvoDevo bio, but nobody asked me. <laughs> but it's about studying how genes control um, the evolution of body parts and patterns. Um, this, by the way, is not the sign language for what I'm saying. It's just sometimes when it's complicated, I talk with my hands. Um, but a prominent science communicator in print, radio, and television, our guest is also the author of The Serengeti Rules, the quest to discover how life works and why it matters. And by the way, uh, that documentary is streaming on PBS right now and won an Emmy for Outstanding Nature Documentary. And so if you're, you're looking to level up the quality of your binge game, uh, you're welcome. Now, I'm admittedly very biased uh, about our guest for a couple of uh, random reasons. First, uh, because of his, uh, his article in The Skeptic. I don't know if anybody got a, anybody got a chance to read that. Uh, it was called Comedians Can Help Us See the Funny Side of a World Governed by Blind Chance. Yes. Yes, we can. And second, for a completely chance fact, uh, we are both September babies. <laughs> he is uh, September 17th. I am September 2nd. That means I'm older. <laughs> but I don't restrict myself to the constraints of the Gregorian calendar. I am open to receiving birthday gifts at any time. But on with it, on with it. Um, here to talk to us um, about his book, A Series of Fortunate Events, Chance and the Making of the Planet, Life and You. Uh, please welcome our esteemed guest, Mr. Sean B. Carroll. Sean, you have the con. Thanks, Leanne. Hey, everybody, let me get set up here with slides for a second. Um, thanks for spending Thursday night together. I really appreciate the interest and uh, hopefully we'll have a little bit of fun, a little bit of conversation. And hopefully you're sitting somewhere warm with a refreshing beverage while I tell you some stories about chance. So um, I want to tell you a few stories from my new book that ask the questions, really, why is the world the way it is? How did we get here? And particularly, does everything happen for a reason or are some things left to chance? Now, philosophers and theologians, they've pondered these questions for millennia. And modern philosophers still do. But nothing puts those beliefs to the test like trauma or a close call. In 2001, Seth MacFarlane was the 27-year-old creator and executive producer of the not-yet-hit Family Guy. And having made a splash at such a young age, he was invited back to speak at his alma mater in Rhode Island. And uh, while well, he tells the rest of his story, to Piers Morgan. A combination of two things. I was uh, I was giving a lecture at my college the night before and went out with some of the faculty afterwards and had had a, a few pints. And uh, <laughs> they got drunk. Yes. And uh, and uh, coupled with the fact that my my travel agent had listed the, uh, the the flight on my itinerary as leaving ten minutes later than it did. And and I was you know I was I was generally late for flights, you know, I'd missed a lot of flights prior to that. So it wasn't, wasn't like it was anything crazily out of the ordinary, but I, I got to the, uh, uh, counter and, and I said, yeah, I'm booked on flight 11. And, and, uh, the one behind the counter said, you know, I'm sorry, you're too late. They just closed the gate. And I said, all right, well, you know, I'll take the 11 o'clock went into the lounge, uh, fell asleep, woke up about 45 minutes later to a, to a commotion and the first plane had hit and, sat there and watched the second plane hit and they announced what flight it was. And I turned to the guy next to me and, and, uh, and said, my, my God, that, that was the flight I was supposed to be on. I, I was late. I missed it. Now McFarland was not the only celebrity to miss American flight 11. Mark Wahlberg was also scheduled to be on the flight, but it changed his plans. Now, 11 years later, McFarland and Wahlberg teamed up to make the movie Ted. So what are the odds? that these two guys would both miss Flight 11 and later make a hit movie? Were their escapes from mass murder just dumb luck or were their lives spared so that our lives would be enriched by a trash talking teddy bear? 
Michelob Ultra Tuscan Orange Grapefruit. My God, America is imploding. I think that's the only scene from the movie I could use and keep a PG rating. So dumb luck, accident, chance, call it what you will. But McFarland's late arrival to the airport was purely an accident, albeit an accident with profound personal consequences. What a difference just 30 minutes can make. It's sobering to think what a thin line there can be between life and death. And what governs that line is a major focus of my new book. Over the past 50 years, as scientists have learned much more about the history and workings of the planet, we've been startled to discover how the course of life has been buffeted by a variety of cosmological and geological accidents, without which we would not be here. And as we've probed human biology and the factors that impact our individual lives, we've caught chance red-handed, reigning over that line between life and death. So tonight, I'm going to highlight a few of those events that reveal just how much we live in a chance-driven world, and then briefly explore what that means for how we think about ourselves. So speaking of thin lines, that's exactly what puzzled a geologist working the, near the town of Gubbio, Italy, in the 1970s. Just outside this gorgeous medieval town, geologist Walter Alvarez saw an interesting pattern in a column of rock very close to the road. And what he noticed was, if you look over here on the left, was that in one section of the many layers of limestone, there was a switch in color from white below to red above. And when he looked closer, he saw that there was a peculiar layer of grayish greenish clay separating the two colors of rock where the coin is over here on the right. Alvarez's decryption of that one centimeter thin line began to tell the story of the most important day on earth in the last 100 million years. A day that was very, very unlucky for most everything alive, but would eventually turn out to be extremely fortunate for us. And on that day, a long, long time ago, 30 minutes would make all the difference. Now the Scubio rock formation was once part of an ancient seabed, so it contains the fossilized shells of tiny creatures called foraminifera, or forams for short shown here in the scanning electron microscope. These are abundant single-celled organisms that are part of the ocean's food chain. And when forams die, their, cell, their shells settle in ocean sediments, try saying that many times fast, and form parts of limestones that are then pushed up by tectonic forces. When Alvarez looked at the forams from the rock cut outside Gubbio, he saw that the white layer of rocks below, shown here from the bottom, contained fossil forams that were large and very diverse. Whereas above that layer in the red rock, he found only a few species of very small forams. And in that thin layer of clay that separated those two colors of rock, they appeared to lack fossils altogether. So Alvarez realized something dramatic had happened in the ocean that had driven many foram species extinct in a very short period of time. Now that boundary was also known from terrestrial deposits shown here from the American West. The pocket knife is pointing to a boundary that's well known to geologists because it marks a dividing line between two worlds 66 million years ago. Below the boundary lay rocks of the Cretaceous period, which make up the last third of the age of reptiles when dinosaurs ruled the land. Above the boundary lay rocks of the Paleogene, which contain no dinosaurs, but marks the beginning of the age of mammals when furry animals emerged to become the largest animals on land and in the seas. Alvarez and his colleagues wondered, what on earth could have caused the disappearance of widespread tiny organisms like forams, as well as much larger creatures like dinosaurs? Now, as you've most likely heard, it was traces of the rare element iridium in that clay layer that led them to propose that it wasn't something on earth, but something from space. An asteroid six miles wide, traveling approximately 50,000 miles per hour, slammed into the Yucatan Peninsula. The enormous mass of rock blasted out of the crater was hurled in all directions. A thick curtain of ejecta traveled across North America, while the impact plume, consisting of superheated air, carbon dioxide, water and sulfur vapor, vaporized rock, chunks of target rock, 
shot ejected at velocities greater than Earth's escape velocity into and beyond the atmosphere, which then fell back down across the globe as trillions of red hot meteors. The result was hell on Earth. Those red hot meteors superheated the atmosphere to four to 600 degrees Fahrenheit, the temperature of a baking oven and triggered global wildfires. The impact plume and soot from the burning wildfires blocked out the sun. Global temperatures dropped at least 20 degrees Fahrenheit, probably more on average across the entire globe. Food chains collapsed and this blackout lasted at least a decade, perhaps as many as 30 years. And during that time and thereat following, three quarters of all plant and animal species, including the great dinosaurs, went extinct. But the asteroid impact is the mother of all accidents. And that's because it turns out it took some special circumstances for the mass extinction to happen. Geologists now realize that the destructive power of the plume depends upon the mineral content of the rocks at the impact site. And that only one to 13% of Earth's entire surface contains the right kinds of rocks to trigger a mass extinction when vaporized. And what that means is with the Earth rotating at 1,000 miles per hour, had this asteroid, which had been circulating the solar system for perhaps 4 billion years, has that asteroid arrived at Earth just 30 minutes earlier, it lands in the Atlantic. 30 minutes later, lands in the Pacific. And in either case, you probably don't have a mass extinction. The dinosaurs would still be here, and we're not. And of course, it means there would be no Ted, and God forbid, no Ted too. Now, let me show you another collision. This one's a little more personal. In this clip, the collision at the upper right also triggers a shower of chemicals. But this time, life does not end, it begins. And that's because this is the moment of fertilization. The trembling and the shower are part of the sequence of dramatic physical and chemical changes that occur in the egg that prevent fertilization by other sperm and begin the process of embryonic development. Out of a swarm of 100 million or more contenders, only a single lucky sperm will swim all the way up the fallopian tube and successfully fertilize the egg. The fertilized egg then is the union of two genomes, half of its chromosomes from the sperm and half from the unfertilized egg. Now here's an astounding fact. No two fertilized human eggs will ever be the same, ever be the same. And to see why, let's try a pop quiz. Okay, you ready? So, by each contributing 23 chromosomes, how many genetically unique children could your parents have? Or if you're a couple, how many could you and your partner have? Okay, I'll give you a second to think about that. 23 chromosomes coming from each. What do you think? 23? 46? I don't know, maybe 92? Nope, try 70 trillion. That's right, 70 trillion. And what that means is that fertilization, well, that's the accident of all mothers. And to see why, let's break down the math. Now, the number of possible chromosome combinations from dad can easily be calculated because he has two alternative versions of each chromosome, and there are 23 chromosomes. So the number of possible different co chromosome combinations that can come from dad is 2 to the 23rd power. And that is 8,388,608. And the math is exactly the same for mom, 23 chromosomes, two alternatives of each chromosome, more than 8 million combinations. But the number of possible combinations of sperm and egg, the number of possible unique children is the product of those two numbers, which gives you shown here in red, 70 trillion, 368 billion, 744 million, 177,664 genetically unique children. So after my arrival at 10 pounds, five ounces, my mom stopped at four. 
But this enormous number is actually an underestimate because of another important contributor to genetic diversity, and that's mistakes. I'm talking about the copying of DNA, six billion letters in you and I. Heck, it's so easy to make mistakes in much shorter pieces of text. Let me show you a couple of my favorite examples. So I've been a baseball fan all my life. And when I was a little kid, I would read the sports pages every day. And I clipped out this article from my local paper, the Toledo Times in 1974, because I spotted a few mistakes in it. I've kept it ever since, sharing it with you tonight. There are three mistakes in this article. Let's see if you can spot them all. I'll give you a few seconds. All right, here we go. See if you can spot all three mistakes. Okay, here's one. Here's another. Yep, and here's the third that caught my eye. That might have, must have been quite a wallop. Now, I don't think these were intentional. They're random mistakes, typos. Here's another howler from a slightly but only slightly higher authority than the Toledo Times. I'm showing you a snippet from the version of the 1631 King James Bible and drawing your attention to the seventh commandment. I think this must be the commandment. <clears throat> this must be the version, at least, of the Bible that's in the White House bedroom. Now, the blasphemy was not detected for a year. King Charles I, well, he was quite upset. He ordered that all copies be burned revoked the printer's license, one of whom went on to die in prison. What a difference a single letter or word can make. Well, the same is true in life's alphabet. Let me show you. What a difference a typo can make. Well, I'm going to show you a little piece of text. In this case, it's the translated text. It's the one letter amino acid code. Don't have to worry about those details. And when this original text is changed to this one, where that middle M becomes an R, that's killed more than 33 million people. Now, how can such a small change be so deadly? I'll get to that in a few minutes. But the crux of the matter is the cause of that change. And that leads me to the DNA molecule. Now, this is the structure that was first deciphered by Watson and Crick in 1953. And the key leap was the discovery of the rules for the pairing of bases located on opposing strands of the double helix, G with C, A with T. Now a footnote to that discovery is actually of central importance to my discussion today. I'll give you a fair warning. I'm gonna talk a little chemistry because the details are so revelatory, but, but don't worry, everyone's gonna get the gist of this. So it turns out that the bases in DNA occur in two forms called tautomers, and they differ by the position of one hydrogen atom on the ring, and this gets a larger ring on something like G. Now at first, Watson, James Watson, he only knew about the less common form, and that stumped him. It blocked him from actually figuring out the proper structure. But a colleague straightened him out and told him that that was not the common form. The more common form was different, and that was a key breakthrough. Now, the difference between these two tautomers I've tried to highlight here. So if you notice this oxygen up here, it doesn't have a hydrogen bonded to it, but down here it does. But in this ring, this nitrogen has a hydrogen bonded to it, and it doesn't down here. And the bottom form is called the enol form, and the upper form is called the keto form. And it turns out that it's the keto form that's the more common form. And you might say, so what? Why are you dragging me through all this, especially on a Thursday night? Well, I'm telling you this because the really important point is that different forms of the same base, they bond with different bases. Well, so what? Well, you'll see in a second. Now, only very recently has it been possible to capture and measure the transition between the two forms. And that reveals that the enol form is fleeting. It's flickering back and forth, enol to keto, and the enol form lasts only about one one thousandth of a second before flipping back to the keto form. And that's why we say it's most often in the keto form. Okay, but what, why does that flipping matter? Well, that flipping matters because if the different forms can bond with different bases, that if the DNA helix is opened up and the copying machinery is moving by, and in a bacterium, for example, it moves at about a thousand bases per second, whoosh, 
If by chance it passes when the enol form is present, the wrong base gets inserted, creating a mutation. What you're looking at is the fundamental basis for random mutation. Now, what we've learned by understanding this shape shift in basis is the event at the root of mutation. It's an inescapable fundamental matter of physics. What's described as a quantum transition between chemical states, a chance shape shift at the atomic level. And what that reveals is that mutation is a feature, not a bug in DNA. In every organism, in every cell, whenever DNA is copied, changes will occur because the intrinsic characteristics of the very bases that endow DNA with its properties. Change is inevitable, unavoidable. Now, therefore, because every species DNA is different and changed in this way, every individual's DNA is different and changed in this way. This tells us that chance is the source of all innovation all beauty, all diversity in the living world. Kind of hard to imagine, isn't it? But let me show you how chance invents. And so speaking of beauty, get a load of this guy. Okay, the important thing about the Antarctic eel pout is, is not how it looks, but where it lives. And where it lives is in the Antarctic Ocean, which is very cold and water is about minus 1.8 degrees Celsius. And the main enemy of fish in these waters is not so much the cold, but ice. The water contains small ice crystals that should they enter the fish through its gills or ingested through its mouth, will nucleate the formation of larger ice crystals and bam, their fish sticks. So that would freeze the animals were it not for a key invention. And that invention is, antifreeze. Eel pout blood does not freeze until it reaches about minus 2.1 degrees Celsius, colder than the Antarctic Ocean. And the reason being is it's chock full of proteins that work as antifreeze. The antifreeze lowers the temperature at which ice crystals can grow, blocking the nucleation of larger ice crystals. Now the really neat and important part of this story is that we can track the origin of antifreeze code how it evolved from an entirely different gene, a forensic trail of how this invention arose, and it shows us how chance mutation is an inventor. So it took some expert genetic sleuthing that recognized that the antifreeze gene bore an uncanny resemblance to another gene that did something completely, else, completely different in the fish's physiology. It's involved in the synthesis of a particular sugar, which we don't care about so much. But what that sleuthing showed was that the tail end of that sugar making protein looked very much like the antifreeze. And we looked in detail at the genes involved. The biologist discovered that what had happened was that really mutation had taken out the core of this gene called SAS. And what was left behind was essentially the antifreeze activity. So mutation removed much of the gene and the remaining chunk encoded, encoded a bit of protein that on its own had some ability to bind to ice crystals. So this is the genesis of antifreeze. And the eel pout's ancestors then ran or rather swam with this invention. And they made many more copies of this gene, which enables them to make many more copies of antifreeze and fill their bloodstream with antifreeze protein. So if you look in this fish's chromosomes, you see more than 30 copies of the antifreeze gene, bam, 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 tandemly arrayed. And you look at fish from northern waters and you don't see this at all. A telltale signature that something new has been invented and exploited by these fish. Now I could show you many more examples of the creativity of mutations. I'm gonna spare you that, let this one example, just make the point that mutation, thus chance, is the inventor. In order for something new to come about, genes must be changed in some way, and they are changed at random. And what this means is, look around you. We live in a world of mistakes generated by chance. 
Genetic accidents occur at random. They change genes without regard to the potential consequences. Now, the fate of the mutation depends on external circumstances in a sieving process we call natural selection. And what determines those circumstances? Well, let's look at the eel pout example. The most relevant thing to the eel pout's lifestyle is where it lives in those, that cold ocean. And so you might ask, how and why did the Antarctic Ocean become so darn cold? And the answer involves tectonics. You may know that the world's continents and oceans are on tectonic plates that move around the globe and have moved for a very long period of time. And it turns out that a couple of plates are of particular interest in terms of the cooling of the Antarctic and the freezing over the Antarctic continent, making the ocean colder. And those involve um, the separation of Antarctic from the South America, which isolated the continent and made the waters cooler, but also involves the movement of the Indian subcontinent plate, which 65 million years ago was actually below the equator down towards Madagascar and moved very quickly northward and slammed into Asia around 40 million years ago and built, started to build the Himalaya. And it was the building of that mountain range that actually cooled the globe quite a bit and caused the glaciation of the Antarctic, which used to be a verdant green continent. Okay, so if I'm telling you the Antarctic is so cool and the waters around it are so cool because of plate tectonics, you then might say, well, why did those plates move in the way that they did? Okay, well, we know a bit about what governs the movement of these plates and it has to do with their size, their shape and their thickness. It turns out we know about, for example, the Indian subcontinent was part of a much larger continent, a supercontinent 140 million years ago that broke up and sent these plates scattering about the surface of the, of the globe. And if you say what determines the size and shape and thickness of those chunks of continent, well, it turns out what appears to be the same thing that determines what happens when you drop a kitchen plate on the floor. It breaks at random. And it just so happens that the Indian subcontinent, a thinner slice of that plate, moved far more quickly than all the other continents. And what that tells us is that the size, shape, and speed of these plates is a matter of chance. So that internal process of mutation governed by chance invents, and the fate of that invention depends upon circumstances shaped by chance. We're a long, long way from Providence, and I don't mean the capital of Rhode Island. It's astonishing that blind chance is the source of all novelty, diversity, and beauty in the biosphere. I hope you're awestruck at what an asteroid, sliding tectonic plates, and just a fibrillating polymer of just four bases has wrought. But our chance-driven existence also poses the unsettling quandary that we don't live in the best of all possible worlds, just our world. In this view, as all members of this organization understand, this view shatters traditional beliefs about cause and effect in the world. Those beliefs are represented, for example, by this book and quote by a theologian, R.C. Sproul, who categorically rejects the existence of chance in his book called Not a Chance, The Myth of Chance in Modern Science and Cosmology. Spruer writes, it is not necessary for chance to rule in order to supplant God. Indeed, chance requires little authority at all if it is to depose God. All it needs to do the job is to exist. The mere existence of chance is enough to rip God from his cosmic throne. Chance does not need to rule, it does not need to be sovereign. If it exists as a mere impotent, humble servant, it leaves God not only out of a date, but out of a job. All right, so according to Sproul, chance puts God out of a job, or at least many of the jobs we've traditionally assigned to him or her. God's not in the conception business choosing the winning sperm and egg, nor the genetic engineering business designing creatures' DNA and traits nor the weather making business, nor the cancer business, nor as it turns out, the pandemic business. Recall I showed you that little typo before 
that killed 33 million people. Well, now I'll reveal that that original piece of text I showed you is part of a virus called the simian immunodeficiency virus, or SIV. And the mutated form is the corresponding part of HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus. And the significance of that M to R change is it's that change that enables chimpanzee SIV to infect humans, which has occurred by accident at least three separate times and triggered the AIDS pandemic. So if not theologians, who do we turn to to think about chance and its implications? Well, I choose for a start, novelist Kurt Vonnegut. Now Vonnegut in his semi-autobiographical novel, Slapstick, describes the day when he visited his sister Alice who was dying of cancer at age 41. It turned out to be the last day of her life. And he writes, Hers would have been an unremarkable death statistically if it were not for one detail, which is this. Her healthy husband, James Carmelt Adams, the editor of a trade journal for purchasing agents, which he put together in a cubicle on Wall Street, had died two mornings before on the broker's special, the only train in American railroading history to hurl itself off an open drawbridge. Think of that. This really happened. Now, you may know Vonnegut concocted lots of fantastic scenarios in his books, but this really did happen, just as he said. The train plunged off the drawbridge, killing his brother-in-law. Now, Vonnegut wasn't going to tell his sister about this. She was always already worried enough about the fate of her children, who were going to be in the sole care of her husband. But another patient saw the story, showed the newspaper to Alice, and she read her husband's name among the list of victims. And her reaction, Vonnegut writes, since Alice had never received any religious instruction, and since she had led a blameless life, she never thought of her awful luck as being anything but accidents in a very busy place. Good for her. Accidents in a very busy place indeed. We now know that we are all here, both collectively and individually, through a series of accidents, cosmological, geological, and biological accidents. Vonnegut's books helped me to realize that next to scientists, the one group of people that seem least inclined to think everything happens for a reason, and rather that blind chance governs the world, are humorists and comedians. So many great present day comedians, Seth MacFarlane, Eddie Azard, Eric Idle, Bill Maher, Ricky Gervais, Sarah Silverman, and more are all on the record on this. And late greats from Mark Twain to Vonnegut to George Carlin, they've rejected traditional beliefs about cause and effect in the world. So many very funny people. In fact, it made me wonder, why is this so? What do scientists and comedians have in common? Why are comedians even drawn to such subjects? And I reached out to a few, some of whom kindly took the time to reply. And I'll leave that conversation for those of you who want to read the book. I'm going to close today on two pearls of wisdom that seem especially apt for these times. And the first is from Ricky Gervais, who told 60 Minutes, it always comes back to us. Why are we here? Well, we just happen to be here. We couldn't choose it. We're not special. We're just lucky. And this is a holiday. We didn't exist for 14 and a half billion years. Then we got 80 or 90 years if we're lucky, and then we'll never exist again. So we should make the most of it. But even the most jaded skeptic struggles when bad things happen. How do we cope? Well, I think Eric Idle has the best answer. When you do find yourself in in a kind of a, a, you know a dark place like that, something going wrong, I mean, how do you deal with with difficult stuff like that, Eric? Well, you know, philosophy has really helps. I mean, you know, some some things in life are bad; uh, they can really make you mad. <laughs> Other things just make you swear and curse. When you're chewing on life's gristle, you will whistle. And this old 
Always look on the bright side of life. Always look on the bright side of life. Life is jolly one that's something you forgot. And that's the laugh and smile and dance and sing. When you're failing in the dance, don't be silly chance. Just burst your lips and which all men to be. Hey, always look on the bright side of life. Always look on the bright side of life. For life is quite absurd, and death's the final word. You must always face the curtain with a bow. Forget about your sin, give the audience a grin. Enjoy it, it's your last chance, and so always look on the bright side of death. And just before you draw your terminal breath. Life's a piece of shit when you look at it. Life's a laugh and death's a joke, it's true. You'll see it's all a show. Keep the laughing as you go. Just remember that the last laugh is on you. Hey, always look on the bright side of life. Always look on the bright side of life. Come on, you be there. Here we go. Always go across the right side of life. Very good. Always go across the right side of life. What have you got to lose? Come from nothing. You guys say it to nothing. What have you lost? Nothing. And always look on the right side of life. Thanks a lot for listening. Let's take some questions. Wow. Wow. That was great. Oh my goodness. I was, I was sitting in my office, like just sort of rocking back and forth to that, which is tremendous for me because I am a glass half empty girl. Whew. So that was a lovely reminder. Uh, Sean, thank you so much for that. So many takeaways. Um, I will, I will let you know if your mom stopped at four, my mom stopped at two. <laughs> <laughs> she cut her chances there uh, quite significantly. And uh, were you the wow. young? You I, the oh, yeah, I'm the baby. Can't you tell? Uh, the babies are always the cut ups. That's right. Yeah, I, I'm the baby and the um, and an only girl, the only girl. So I'm royalty in my family. <laughs> um, but yes, mutation is a feature, not a bug. Wow. Um, and chance is the source of all innovation you know if that doesn't break you out of your comfort zone i don't know what will and um that the, that sprawl quote that you read um from his book not a chance it really reminded me of that section in i don't know if you're a douglas adams fan but the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy where um god was sort of he disproved himself with the existence of the babel fish and then disappeared <laughs> Um, I hope I'm getting that right. My Hitchhikers fans will certainly uh, clarify if, if I have not. And my answer to all of that is 42. But we do have questions for you. And one of the early ones uh, it was, is about the cover of your book. Who drew that? Uh, Natalia Balnova. And the book, the book has a lot of drawings like that. We, the, the book has, um, has a lighthearted attitude, even if it's dealing with you know, some profoundly important ideas. And we thought that um, some of these drawings of, uh, you know, asteroid collisions and fertilization and a whole variety of things would, uh, would, would make the, the presentation feel a little more reader friendly. Nice, nice. She and did a great I will, job. I couldn't have been happier with those diagrams. And, and I will remind everybody, uh, indeed, that you can pre-order, you can get the book um, using, uh, the code is ASOFE-FG. That's A-S-O-F-E-F-G. And you get 30% off. 
uh, of the book when you order from Princeton University Press. And it includes free shipping, everybody, kind of like Amazon. Ooh, did I say the A word? I'm so sorry. Um, now we get into a little bit of the science here. Um, this is from Lawrence Malander. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, do all living things have the same enol keto mechanism for mutation? Great question. Thanks. Yeah. So this is this is just the properties of, of DNA and as it turns out of RNA. And it's the what are called the purines A and G that have the higher rate of this kenol, uh, keto enol shift. Um, but no, it's it's everywhere you look. It's just it's an intrinsic property of the DNA bases. Uh, it has to do with this this uh, uh, quantum shift in, in that one single hydrogen. And um, so this is this underlies all mutation. Now realize there are other mechanisms of mutations. There's other ways that DNA gets shuffled around. But this is this way sort of single letters get changed in DNA, which is a very prevalent mechanism. Um, so I don't want you to think this is the only mechanism of mutation, but it's really sort of the fundamental one that's universal. Okay. Um, Stuart Weiss said that uh, some have suggested that quantum indeterminacy supports the idea of human free will. Do you, do you, and does chance and random variation have anything to say about this question? I'm not sure I should well, have asked this question. Uh... <laughs> Let's, let's talk about for, for, about human free will. Look, 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 so what we're saying is in the physical world, right, that chance is ruling the physical world. Now, here we are. We are products of this physical world, this, this interplay between internal mutation and the external environment in which we live, shaped by umpteen chance events. But, you know, and I'll, I'm going to take a little digression here for a second. When you even just think about humans, I didn't tell, I tell this story in the book, but I didn't tell it in the talk, which is... The reason why we're having this conversation is not only the asteroid, um, but um, probably the ice ages. So you may know that the last couple million years on Earth, we've been in an ice age, cycles of glaciation and, and interglacials. And that's really unusual. It's the first ice ages in 300 million years. And paleoanthropologists have good reason to assert that it's coping with this really wild swings in climate, which are warm and cold in, in sort of the northern latitudes, but they're wet and dry in places like East Africa, that we as an animal coped a lot better. We started using tools two and a half million years ago or so, and we could shape our own habitat. And then of course we commanded fire. And it's during this two million years of the ice age that our brain size expands about threefold, which is just remarkable by comparison to anything else on earth. And so we seem to be the essentially be adapted to this really volatile climate, long-term climate pattern. And so, and that, by the way, the ice ages were probably kicked in, especially by the uh, collision of the Indian subcontinent with, with Asia. So we ourselves, this thinking, speaking creature, you know, are product of some pretty unusual climatic circumstances. And we recognize free will, right? That Chance doesn't govern all our lives. We can decide whether or not we watch this seminar. We can decide who we vote for. We can decide whether to accept the results of an election. Oh, wait, <laughs> I'm, going off, I'm going off script here. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, um, so I think it's it's important to distinguish things that are ruled in the natural world by by chance events and in, in the in the submolecular realm by quantum events with our own free will, which we have as a biological creature with an oversized brain. Well, some of us, <laughs> maybe not so oversized. And I, I'm not adapting well. Uh, I'm, I, I'm, I've been cold since September. Who wears, who wears turtlenecks in September? So maybe one of, maybe one of, my, one of my genes is off a bit, um, which brings me to Emily Wright's question. Could you further explain why G changes in DNA? And also, is it only G that changes in this manner? Right, so there are four bases, and just by shorthand, G, A, C, and T. G does this more frequently, albeit only you know one one thousandth of a second, right? So it flickers for that. A is next, uh, and then C and T much less often. So really, G is kind of the most important. A is the second most important in terms of frequency of this sort of event. Now, why it happens is simply has to do with, in, in especially in these ring compounds, that hydrogens can sort of be 
bonded in different places in that ring. It, it's very easy for a sense, essentially for them to shift position. This, that's what's referred to as a quantum transition. So it just has to do with the structure of these bases, their, their fundamental chemistry, and it's an intrinsic property. It doesn't have to do with you know, any fault of sort of the cell or anything like that that surrounds it. Now, there are things that in the environment that can influence the frequency of this. So some chemicals will modify bases and greatly increase the rate of mutation. Um, that's carcinogens, for example, in tobacco smoke, or ultraviolet light can do things to DNA that increase the, the, the frequency of mutations or break the DNA and then the, re the repair is sort of sloppy. So there's other ways to cause mutations. There are external insults that can cause mutations, but in sort of like, if you did this in the most perfect of all conditions, mutations are going to happen because of the intrinsic properties of the bases that endow DNA with, with its function. When you uh, when you started, you know, with the you know G and then name the others, I'm like, oh my gosh, he's going to talk about Medicare and then all the parts, because that, <laughs> <laughs> which I think is more complicated. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm finding out. I've had to learn this from yeah. my parents. Um, here's a fun one, and I I already know the answer. Uh, are you related to the famous Sean Carroll? <laughs> that would be the other famous Sean Carroll. <laughs> which one are you talking about? Uh, so Sean and I have had a really, so Sean M. Carroll at Caltech, the cosmologist who, you know, who's also a great, who's, well, who is a great author. I shouldn't say also. Jesus, I always say that. Um, oops, slipped. Uh, in fact, I just did his podcast in October. Mm -hmm. so I want to have a little bit of fun. That's, that's Sean Carroll talking to Sean Carroll. And you could say, what are the odds? You know, two Sean Carrolls that uh, write books, do science. We kind of work at different ends of the spectrum, but uh, we have similar senses of humor. We've had a good time with that. And um I think we should just franchise ourselves and kind of go on tour. Yeah, I, you know, I listened to that that podcast. I'm like, that's an opportunity. You know, ladies and gentlemen, the Sean Carroll Squared Show. <laughs> yes, two nerds for one. There you go. Yeah, two nerds for one. There you go. There's your tagline. You are off and running. Um, Lawrence has another question. He goes, "What do you think of people who have such a hard time accepting that chance is real?" I mean, clearly these people aren't going to Vegas, but well, this this in fact. I, you know, I had lots of reasons for writing this book and for going down in this subject area. And, and part of it is kind of our love-hate relationship with chance. People pour into Vegas, right? And they often pour into Vegas or wherever else they may go or buy lottery tickets, sort of thinking they have an influence on the outcome of purely random events, right? So our brains can kind of trick us to think that, gee, if we see, you know, black come up three times on the, on the roulette wheel, we may think, oh, then the next one's got to be red, or we may think the next one's going to be black. But of course, you know, it's a completely random event. It has no, the, the next event has no dependency on the prior events. Mm. And, and so we get excited, we, we wager our money, you know, we're influenced a lot by, and, and, you know, we, we love these games of chance, but when it comes to our lives, and I mean, look at all of us, we're meeting this way because some randomly mutating viruses and some wildlife in China hopped into a human and, and stopped the world, right? Mm -hmm. Well, look at the power of chance. We're, we're living through it, right? That there's millions of viruses in the world that are out there randomly mutating and occasionally they spill over into humans. And, and you know, I never imagined anything happening on the scale of what we've experienced this year, even though I've, I've studied spillover events, we even made a film about spillover events a couple of years ago in the middle of the Ebola and Zika stories, but just couldn't imagine this. So um, yeah, so people may not, I mean, over half of Americans, if you poll them, over half of Americans believe that essentially everything happens for a reason. So they kind of do push chance out of the picture. But when it comes to whether we have, you know, the gender of a child, when it comes to, um, you know, sort of the luck of our genetic makeup, when it comes to diseases like cancer, you know, it's, I, you know, it's driven by chance and our, our existence. I, that's why I also tell the story of the asteroid because most people have heard the story. Um, you can point people to the evidence. They can go all over the globe and put their finger right on that boundary and realize that there's dinosaurs down there and no dinosaurs above except for birds, non-avian dinosaurs. And somebody pointed it out on the Q&A correctly, mm -hmm. but none of the big guys that you know about. And um, the world changed right there virtually in an instant. And we know where that hit. You can go to the site in, in uh, Chicxulub, Mexico, and you can see all that. So you can try to ignore a chance, but it's, it's everywhere. And the more, especially in my field, in, in genetics and molecular genetics, 
you know, 50 years ago, we inferred these mechanisms that were random involving mutation. But now, you know, we can study mom, dad, and child and say, oh, child has, you know, 23 mutations that weren't present in either mom or dad. This is the new stuff that's happened in the new generation. Pinpoint exactly where they've happened on which chromosomes. So we've kind of taken the, um, there's, there's, there's not much room for, it, there's no extrapolation going on. It's direct empirical evidence of sort of the action of chance. And then biochemists have caught essentially chance red-handed. They've, they've captured this flipping event in, you know, very, using very sophisticated machinery. Um, so you can deny it, but the last 50 years have been a bonanza for geology, for climatology, for molecular biology in terms of understanding the role of chance in all these scales. I have a very uh, cheery question from David Cole. Uh, does the role of chance in the world imply that life has no meaning or purpose? Oh, it's a great breathe, question. Breathe, David, please breathe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this is, you know, this is, uh, you know, it, it's commonly asserted that, you know, you need, for example, to have a creator in the picture or, you know, an afterlife or something like this. But no, I don't think it follows logically or anything like that. I, I think that, um, and there's lots of great thinkers about this. And what I actually did in the book, so I, I'm sorry to be touting the book, but I, I'm only going to give a short answer now, but a little bit longer answer is in the afterword of the book where I collect various people together sort of virtually for a conversation, everyone from Sarah Silverman and Seth MacFarlane to Albert Camus and Jacques Bonneau and Kurt Vonnegut and have a conversation about chance and, and meaning and purpose. And I think that um, many people can, can understand that you know, the, 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 the purpose is, is what you make of it. Life is what you make of it. And you, the, what your meaning on this, <laughs> and, and this life is not determined by the next one. Um, as, as I think Ricky Gervais put, put so well. So um, no, you, you find your purpose in the time that you have here and you, you live a meaningful adventure. And many people have said that far better than I have. I'd, I'd recommend Albert Camus to start. Nice, nicely done. Um, I, I know I asked for questions, but there are a couple of comments here um, from Rich Worth. He already bought the book and he's enjoyed uh, the previous. And uh, someone wants to know, especially since uh, somebody on this screen has an Emmy, <laughs> that uh, will this be a special as well? Are you looking to... to... Too, er too early days, thank you. Thank you, thanks for the prior books. Thanks for asking about films. Um, too early to tell. If I was to confess, you know, my hope and if you've read the book, you know, the book is done, as I said, with a little bit of a light heart, a little bit of a grin. And there's a reason why I'm alluding to comedians and things like this and, and dealing with this material. And so my notion is to, to, to put this on film, I'd love to do it with a little bit of um, a smile. Um, and so that would mean collaborating with different sorts of folks than I have in telling sort of um, nature stories or sort of straight science stories. So, um, We'll see if that opportunity arises. The book's only been out for a little, uh, not even two months. So uh, too early to tell if there'll be a film version of it. But I'd, I'd, I'd like to give it a, give it a try and um, try to make it um, fun yet impactful. Well, we, and this was a, a conversation that you and I had earlier, and I, I think people will appreciate it. The fact that um, not only are you a scientist, but you do produce films because it's another way to tell the story, tell the stories of science in a visual way um, that that bring in that bring people in and get them to understand it. I mean, as many ways as you can tell the story, um, tell it. And film is powerful. And film tra it, it travels really well and lasts really long. And you know, relative to sitting down with a book, you know, sixty or ninety minutes of a film, um, you know, people are willing to invest that if you tell a story. The critical thing here is, if I can preach for a second to. Uh, there are obviously many scientists in the audience, but you know, I think it, this is on us. That scientists often think that if you just kind of knew what we knew, you know, the world would be great. And that's probably true. But, but you know, we're competing with every other story in the world and that for scientists to get people's attention and to hold their attention, their voluntary attention with all the things they have going on in their lives, we have to tell the story well in an engaging way, whatever that might be, visually engaging, emotional, take people on adventure, show them things they've never seen before, awe, wonder, beauty, all that sort of thing. So it's, you know, we have to think about as scientists, you know, not just what we communicate, but how we communicate 
and I think filmmakers are nat are great collaborators because as as visual storytellers, they just have a whole bag of imagination to to uh, deploy. And um, I've just had a great time collaborating with with so many filmmakers. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, someone asked the question, and I'm almost sure of the answer, but I don't uh, want to assume. Your book is available uh, in Kindle form. As yeah, well. I actually read the darn thing. That's the first time I did that. Well, that's audio. That's audio, but Kindle, but, uh, but... Kindle. yeah, sure, on Kindle. Sorry, I was thinking of the of the audio book, but um, yeah. Anyway, it's a, it's a, it's available in all forms. Yes. Yeah. Oh, oh yes. And yes, you, you, you did talk about that you did the audio and, and you read you read the book, which I, I think is awesome. During oh, during COVID that. time with, um, you know, couldn't be in a studio. So I had to read it, you know, over the internet with lawnmowers, leaf blowers, helicopters and everything else trying to trying to ruin the reading over about uh, a many day period. So but uh, apparently we got the audio we needed. Um, I know we are we are at the eight o'clock hour and we do try to keep this to the hour. So I, I wanna thank you for your time. And there was a, a comment in here that was very sweet. Someone honestly said they signed up and they weren't sure who was speaking and what was going on and, and, and what it was gonna be. And they are totally flabbergasted and impressed, jaw on the floor. <laughs> so mission accomplished, sir. Well, that's that's too kind. Um, I, I really appreciate that. And, and, and I think that's, I just a minute ago with my comment, I think that's also the standard I hold myself to, which is, you know, I, I hope you heard a story or two that might stick and, um, you know, just help convey this idea. Chance is a huge idea. I think it's been very underappreciated. Look, I'm an evolutionary biologist. The idea of natural selection, which I don't mean to diminish at all, um, has gotten a lot of discussion, but I think that chance is the powerful philosophical part of the equation that random chance, of course, takes out any age, any other kind of agency. And we now, as the decades click by, we have more and more empirical evidence of its importance in the world. So um, I hope everybody got a kick out of it. Well, I will uh, use this as an opportunity to perhaps take more chances. <laughs> uh, but, but Sean, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, everyone. If you missed any of this talk, again, it is recorded and will be available tomorrow on Skeptical Inquirer's uh, website, skepticalinquirer.org. And I hope I will see as many of you or, or, or many of you will be here uh, for our next guest in the series, uh, which is in a scant two weeks. On December 17th, Tim Caulfield will be here talking about the infodemic and how debunking works. So let's get to it. And of course, a, a big thank you to Skeptical Inquirer and to CFI and the tech team of one. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for, uh, for the work in the background that you do. And thank you, everyone. Uh, and I hope to see you in a couple of weeks. And again, Sean, thank you for your time and your talent and your expertise. Thank you, Anne. Have a good night, everyone.